I know him. That can't be. That's that little guy who spoke to me all those years ago. When was it? 85. That poor man, they're going to eat him alive. Oceans rise, empires fall. Next to Washington, they all look small, all alone. Watch them run, they will tear each other into pieces. Jesus Christ, this will be fun. Da 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 The exact numbers of the popular vote wasn't perfectly preserved back then, so we don't know exactly how many votes each candidate got. However, from what we do have, it is fairly clear that Jefferson pretty much just destroyed the popular vote. He got like 60% of the votes and Adams got like 40%. However, because America is weird and confusing, the Electoral College had to cast their votes next. And that's when everything broke the world. Remember, because the Electoral College was weird back then, every elector had to vote for two people. Each party's electors were supposed to do this thing where everybody would vote for their main presidential candidate, so Adams or Jefferson, and then everybody but one person would vote for the vice presidential candidate, Pinckney or Burr. The idea is that the vice presidential candidate would have one vote less than the presidential candidate, so if the presidential candidate actually got chosen, the other guy would probably have to be the vice president just by default. The Federalist electors actually remembered to do their job. One person voted for a writing candidate instead of Pinckney, so Adams ended up with 64 electoral college votes and Pinckney had 63. However, the Federalists did not win the Electoral College. The Democratic Republicans did. What the Democratic Republicans didn't do was not vote for Burr. So, Jefferson and Burr ended up with a tie of Electoral votes, with both of them having exactly 73. And when there's a tie in the Electoral College, the House of Representatives gets to decide who becomes president, and the House of Representatives, at this time, was dominated by Federalists. Can you see where this is going to get interesting? The Federalists were stuck in a pick your poison scenario. Either way, they were going to have a president from the opposing party. However, they basically had to just decide which guy that they thought was going to work with the Federalists the most. Their inclination was to go for Burr, since he's, no offense to Burr, but he's kind of a sneaky snake boy who can't pick a side on anything, so he would likely be more willing to work with the Federalists. However, the Federalists weren't w completely willing to write off Jefferson just yet. They wrote a letter to Jefferson in which they were like, Yo, Tommy Jeffs, man, we will totally elect you president! If you do a few simple things for us, first, you gotta let Alexander Hamilton's bake in New York stand, and you gotta keep some of his economic policies. We may hate the man, but he understands economics better than, like, any of us. And second off, you gotta not fire these specific Federalist people in your cabinet, okay? Jefferson writes back to them, and he's like, um... No, I don't want to owe any favors to you people, because one, that would kind of make me a corrupt president, and B, I hate all of you. So the Federalists are like, alright everybody, send out a party memo, we are officially throwing all of our weight behind Burr in this election. Except, there's one guy that literally no one wants to listen to anymore, who still feels the need to make his opinion on this subject very much heard. That's right, it's ex-Secretary of the Treasury and that run raving crackhead on the back of the bus you always try your best to ignore, Alexander Hamilton! As you will remember, Hamilton and Jefferson hated each other. Their feuds were more well known to the general public because of all their debates over the ratification of the Constitution and because they were both relevant members of the two warring political parties, so everyone expected that if Hamilton were to endorse anyone in this election, even though they don't want him to endorse anyone, but if he were to endorse anyone, it would definitely have been Murr. However, Hamilton surprises everyone and starts a frenzied letter campaign built entirely around encouraging Federalists to vote for Jefferson and trash-talking Aaron Burr. Hamilton believed that Jefferson was an obnoxious, racist, privileged hypocrite who had completely whack morals. However, in his eyes, Burr had no morals at all. And in his opinion, that made Burr more of a threat to the country than Jefferson. However, everyone hates Hamilton now, as you know, because of the Adams pamphlet and the Reynolds pamphlet, so most people just ignored him. Most people. So, for whatever reason, 
instead of doing like individual votes for this, like how you would expect it to work, instead the House of Representatives just like votes as states, like, all of the representatives from the state will get together and vote, and then, like, whatever the majority of the reps think is, like, one vote, because it's one state, like, what? Is, is this still how this works now? Like, if we were in this event, or is, like, this just more early America weirdness? Anyway, there are currently 16 states in the Union, so for Burr or Jefferson to win, they need to get nine states on their side. There are currently nine Federalist-leading states in the House of Reps, so you'd think that it would be pretty easy for them to just get Burr in as president, right? It should be easy. But it's not. Two Federalist states, Maryland and Vermont, end up deadlocking and not voting for anybody. On top of that, one Federalist state, Georgia, ends up defecting and voting for Jefferson. So now we have eight votes for Jefferson, six votes for Burr, and two states undecided. Meaning that no one has a clear majority and no one wins. The House is like, alright, we'll just vote again. And then the same thing happens. So then they vote again. And again. And again. And again, 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 and again. They spent an entire week voting a total of 35 times, and this entire time, none of these stupid idiots can just vote a different way and break the stupid deadlock. Honestly, my main question is what the heck is up with Maryland and Vermont at this point? Are they just sitting there like, eh? We don't like Jefferson Orber, so you know what, we're just gonna sit back here and say that we're deadlocked just so that we can watch this be way more harder for everyone else. Eventually, after the 35th freaking ballot, the American people start to get a little upset at this because their new president is supposed to be inaugurated in like two weeks, but they don't even know who their new president is because the House of Reps has been spending the last several weeks screwing around refusing to break the goddamn deadlock. Jefferson supporters were especially mad to the point where there are a lot of threats of violence and an out outright civil war flying around. There are rumors that some dudes had, like, stormed an arsenal in Philadelphia and they were, like, marching towards Washington to, like, literally threaten the Federalists out of our nation's capital. There are also some claims that some people in Virginia were going to hold a second constitutional convention to rewrite our nation's most prestigious code of law that you're literally not supposed to be able to rewrite. Virginia, a Democratic-Republican bastion and Thomas Jefferson's home state, literally threatened to secede from the Union if Jefferson was not elected. My favorite thing about this is Jefferson's reaction to this, because Adams wrote him a letter that was like, um, hey, can you, like, tell your fanboys to calm the frick down and, like, not start a civil war? And then Jefferson was like, Adams, you really think that I am responsible for my followers? Like, do you think that if I, Virginia's favorite politician, went and told Virginia to not start a civil war. Do you honestly think that they would listen to me, the person that they're threatening to secede over in the first place? Like, what? That's, that's, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard, Adams. The House of Representatives deadlock was eventually broken by James Bayard, Delaware's only representative. Bayard hated Thomas Jefferson with all of his being, and so he was like, I'm gonna just do what the rest of my party's vote doing and voting for Burr. I don't like this guy, but whatever. But then, Bayard discovers Hamilton's letters on how Burr is a freaking terrible human being, and how Jefferson isn't exactly great, but he's still, you know, an actual human being with emotions rather than a fake political robot who just does whatever will get him the most votes. Bayard sees all of Hamilton's arguments, and he also sees all of the threats of violence being made by the Jefferson supporters, and he thinks, okay, I do genuinely think that Jefferson is a better leader than Burr, and I also don't want Virginia to, you know, secede from the Union, but, like, at the same time, I freaking hate Thomas Jefferson, and I just cannot physically handle the idea of voting for him. Is there any other way I could get him into the presidency? And then Bayard realizes, if he were to abstain from the voting process, then there would only be 15 states in session, and Jefferson would only need to win 8 states in order to get the presidency. But, he's still not 100% sure if he trusts Jefferson, so he goes to talk with this guy who is really close with Jefferson. Although there's no historical or factual basis for this, I really like to imagine that they, like, met in some shady back alley in D.C. somewhere while wearing trench coats or something. Bayard asks this dude, if I abstain and let Jefferson become president, 
Will he accept the terms of the Federalists laid out to him earlier about the, you know, the bank and the economic system and the not firing of the certain people? And the guy's like, oh, heck yes, Mr. Jefferson would. I mean, like, technically, I haven't, like, asked him about it, but, like, I'm, like, 95% sure that he would, okay? The next day, Bayard shows up to work and he's like, sorry, my dudes, I'ma just yeet myself out of here real quick. And the Federalists explode. Like, not literally, but, you know. They're like, bro. Just because some dude with a valley girl accent said that Jefferson would agree to our terms does not mean that Jefferson said he would agree to our terms. Like, that. that's not- that is not how the transitive property works, bro. The Federalists are also angry because Bayard cut the deal with Jefferson without asking if Burr was actually willing to cut any kind of deal as well. So, eventually, they come up with the idea to send two letters, one to Jefferson and one to Burr, asking them if they're still willing to work on the Federalist terms. If Jefferson offers a better deal, then Bayard will abstain, and if Burr offers a better deal, then I guess they'll just keep deadlocking themselves for the next thousand years or something. Jefferson responds first, and he's like, Heck yes, I will cooperate with you people! I am totally down to listen, let's all just forget the fact that I was completely opposed to this idea like a week ago, okay? We don't know exactly what Burr's letters said, because they were probably destroyed right after Congress read them, but um, apparently Burr didn't respond very kindly, because during the 36th and final House of Reps ballot, Bayard abstained. Thomas Jefferson was officially elected as the third president of the United States of America, with Aaron Burr serving as his vice president. Well, now that we've got a president, that's that's it, right? This this video can finally end, right? <laughs> Take the time stamp, kiddo. We're just getting started over here. The election of 1800 is responsible for so much more than just who our third president was. It resulted in an amendment be being added to our Constitution. It created one of the foundations of our judicial branch of government. It literally led to the death of a founding father. And you won't even believe what's about to go down between Adams and Jefferson. Let's continue. During the last few months of the Adams administration, John Adams kind of went insane with political revenge. He was like, all right, America, you want, you want to elect Thomas Jefferson? Fine, just, just peachy keen, just fantastic. Don't mind me, I'm just over here appointing like 60 federal judges that all vehemently oppose everything that Thomas Jefferson stands for and he can't unappoint any of them because federal judges serve for life. So yeah, John Adams' last two days of his term was basically just him giving a gigantic middle finger to Thomas Jefferson and I freaking love it. In order for these people to begin working, they have to receive a commission, which is basically just a formal document that says, hey, the president wants you to come work at this place, so like, come work at this place. The last day of Adam's term, the Senate is just approving all of these people rapid fire as quickly as they can. The Secretary of State, John Marshall, is just like scribbling his signature on all these pieces of paper, trying to get them out. He gives them to his younger brother, of all people, to go out and deliver them, and most of them get delivered. However, about 17 of them do not get delivered on time before Adam's term ends. God dang it, John Marshall's younger brother! Why are you so useless? The next day, Jefferson is inaugurated, and he appoints this dude, James Madison, to be the new Secretary of State. Madison is often considered the father of the Constitution, considering that he wrote many portions of the document, and he also headed the Constitutional Convention, and he would actually become the next president after Jefferson. But what you need to know about him is that he and Jefferson... We're just best friends, okay? Like, they founded the Democratic Republican Party together. They were, like, always hanging out and talking about politics and Virginia and whatever. They they were bros, okay? They, they, were, they were bros. So Jefferson tells his bro Madison, hey, like, you know all those commissions that didn't get delivered? Just, like, never deliver them, okay? Because, like... If, if Adams couldn't get them delivered before his presidential term ended, then they're void, right? And it's, like, not your problem. So, like, I, it's, you shouldn't have to worry about it. And also, I don't like any of these people, so I don't want them appointed. So, like, just, just, just don't appoint them. Okay, okay Madison, okay? Okay. And so, yeah, Madison just has, like, a bunch of signed commissions, signed by John Adams and John Marshall, just sitting in his office, and he just, like, refuses to ever deliver them. One of these guys who was supposed to get a commission but didn't was William Marbury, and he's really salty about it. So he writes Madison, and he's like, yo, can I have my commission, please? And then Madison's like, I'm sorry, my best bro, the president, said I wasn't allowed to. So these two write back and forth for several months, and Madison just refuses to give the guy a thing. So eventually, Marbury he gets so mad that he's like, okay, screw you, I'm taking your butt to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that Marbury did have the right to receive his commission, 
However, the Supreme Court was not legally allowed to order Madison to give it to him. I'm going to try to explain this without it getting too complicated, but like considering that my script for this video is currently like 14 pages long, I, I probably will get ridiculous with it anyway, I'm sorry, this is just how I am. So, jurisdiction is the right of a court to hear a case. Original jurisdiction means that you were the first court to ever hear that case. Appellate jurisdiction is when the case was originally tried in a lower court, but the person who was found guilty felt that their case was mishandled, so they asked to have it appealed up to a higher court. Most of the cases that the Supreme Court hears are appeals, so they would have appellate jurisdiction. However, Marbury v. Madison is one of the rare cases where the Supreme Court actually has original jurisdiction. The fact that the Supreme Court was the first court to hear this case at all is already kind of a problem, but we're going to get into that later. The way that the Supreme Court could order Madison to give Marbury his commission is through a writ of mandamus, or however it's pronounced. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but anyway, it's basically just a legal document that orders a government official to do a thing. The Constitution states that the Supreme Court is only supposed to have original jurisdiction when a state is being sued or when a foreign dignitary is somehow involved in the issue, and they should have appellate jurisdiction everywhere else. However, the court interpreted a law called the Judiciary Act of 1789 as also giving them original jurisdiction in cases relating to writs of mandamus. The only reason the court was hearing that case was because of a direct conflict between constitutional law and statutory law, and that's not supposed to happen, so the court immediately ordered Congress to repeal that law. This was the first time that the Supreme Court ever exercised their power of judicial review, or their ability to strike down the actions of the other branches and call them unconstitutional. This sort of thing seems like a no-brainer to us today, because courts do it all the time, but technically, judicial review is never explicitly stated as a power of the judicial branch in the Constitution, it's just very strongly implied to be there. So, with Marbury v. Madison, the Supreme Court officially announced, we are giving ourselves this power, deal with it. To this day, judicial review still remains one of the most important powers of the judicial branch of government, and as one of our most important checks on the power of the other branches. Meanwhile, in prison, remember that dude James Callender who got thrown in prison for saying that John Adams was a hermaphrodite who wanted to go to war with France? Well, Jefferson used his presidential pardoning power to free Callender from prison. That, that's not shady at all. Not long after his release from prison, Calendar contacts Jefferson and he's like, So, my boy, Prister President Thomas Jefferson, Commander-in-Chief Tommy Jeff, how are you doing? I hope that you really enjoyed being president as a result of my excellent campaigning for you while I was suffering in jail. But I digress. So, I spent, like, time in prison for you. And here's the thing, prison sucks. Prison sucks. I think we can agree on that. Prison sucks. So, here's the thing. I was thinking, since I helped you so generously to win the election, maybe you could just, like, pay me, like, a, a little bit of a bonus. Just a nice, just a nice little thing. And then, like, also, like, maybe a master of, like, a post office somewhere. I just, I just want to be a master of a post office, okay? Like, that, yeah, that ain't a lot to ask, okay? What do you say, Mr. President? To which Jefferson responds... my side. I have better things to do with my time than waste money on you, Calendar. However, something Jefferson should have learned by now is that if you want your political career intact, don't ever cross James Calendar. Just don't do it. In 1802, in a Virginia newspaper, Calendar wrote that Jefferson, and I quote, keeps, and for many years past, has kept, as his concubine, one of his own slaves. Her name is Sally. Yep! The election of 1800 is the reason why the Sally Hemings story broke. Okay, well technically rumors about it had been circulating around for a while, but Calendar was the first person to like collect them all and put them into a convenient little narrative, and therefore his telling of the story is was the most popular at the time. But like, you get the idea. For those not familiar with Sally Hemings, very brief crash course. She was one of Thomas Jefferson's slaves, and she was probably his wife's half-sister, which is just fantastic. Eventually, Jefferson's wife dies, and then after that, Jefferson starts doing things with Sally Hemings, and at the time when this was happening, Jefferson was like 42, and Sally was like 14, and um, 
Miss Hemmings probably did not consent to the relationship. Yeah. The two had, like, six kids together, and then Hemmings made Jefferson promise to free her kids once they reached adult age, and then Jefferson was like, okay, and then he just didn't do that. He did ask in his will for all of her children to be freed upon his death, but rather than listening to the dead man's instructions, all of Jefferson's possessions, which unfortunately included his slaves, were just auctioned off. However, Jefferson's daughter did basically free Sally and let her and two of her sons live freely until her death, so like, that's a minor positive to this story, but like, Overall, this, the, the whole Sally Hemings thing is just a, a terrible situation for everyone involved, except Jefferson, because he got away scot-free. For about 150 years, most historians disregarded the Sally Hemings rumors because, and this is painful to say, but it was true, Jefferson was a successful, highly respected white dude. If he said he didn't do it, people just believed him. However, in 1998, a DNA test was conducted on descendants of Jefferson and just descendants of Hemings, and when their bloodlines were compared, it showed that they shared a lot of DNA, so now it's generally accepted historical fact that Jefferson fathered all of Sally Hemings' children, although, although there are still a minority of historians out there who claim that it was, like, one of Jefferson's sons or nephews or something, but, like, those historians are stupid. Now that we've brought James Callender's subplot full circle, let's check in on America's new vice president, Mr. Aaron Burr, sir. Jefferson didn't like Burr. I'm not entirely sure why, but he just didn't like Burr, so he gave him basically nothing to do as vice president. He wouldn't let him participate in, like, party meetings at all. He gave him hardly anything to do in cabinet meetings. Like, it, it was just a crappy time to be Aaron Burr. Although, to Burr's credit, apparently the Senate did really like him because supposedly he was very fair and nonpartisan when presiding over debates. Eventually, a little thing comes along called our Constitution's 12th Amendment. It changed the way that the Electoral College works so that the president got to, you know, actually choose his vice president, Burr is really excited about this. He's like, oh yeah, now I probably get to keep being vice president for even longer, heck yes! And then Jefferson is like, um, no you don't. I freaking hate you, and now that I actually get to choose who my vice president is, I want it to be someone that I, you know, actually like. So if you could just, like, go and start cleaning out your desk right now, that would be, like, the only useful thing that you've ever done in your entire life, and it would be very kind. So, um, if you could just, like, yeet yourself on out right now, my boy. Burr is upset, for obvious reasons, but the election of 1804 rolls around, and he's like, oh, you know what, if I'm not gonna be vice president, I might as well, you know, try to be something. So he runs for governor of New York. However, someone decides to start writing a bunch of smear campaigns about Burr, and Burr loses the election in what was, at the time, the largest margin of loss in New York's entire history. Can you think of someone who had a grudge against Aaron Burr and who really likes writing down and publishing his opinion on things? It's Alexander Hamilton. Of course it's Alexander Hamilton. Who else would it be? For those of you keeping track at home, Burr has now lost two different elections as a direct result of Hamilton stalking smack about him, and he has just about had it. He writes a somewhat angry letter to Hamilton, and Hamilton writes a somewhat angry letter back, but eventually things start escalating to a ridiculous degree, and eventually Burr asks Hamilton to issue a public apology revoking all of the negative statements he has made about Burr over, like, the entire past 15 years. And Hamilton's like, um, no, no, bruh, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. I'm sorry that I'm so good at telling the truth. To which Burr responds, FIGHT ME, BRO! No, seriously, it's about to get all kinds of Yugi up, up in here, because it is time to duel. Grab a gun, get your butt down to Weehawk in New Jersey, and I'll do the same, and we'll see who manages to shoot each other first. Now, dueling in Weehawk in New Jersey, though it is an objectively fun phrase to say, is a bit of a sensitive subject for Hamilton. Because three years prior to this entire mess, Hamilton's oldest son, Philip, died in a duel in Weehawken, New Jersey, in the exact same spot that Hamilton and Burr ended up having their duel in. I don't know who chose the exact location for this thing. If it was Burr, then either he just didn't know, or like... Damn. But if it was Hamilton, it honestly wouldn't surprise me, because from everything that I've heard about Hamilton during this duel, he was, like, not okay. For one thing, the gun that he used in this duel was also used during Philip's duel, 
the thing that I read didn't specify if it was actually Philip's gun or not, but, like, I have to assume that it was, because it's hard to imagine some dude going up to Hamilton and being like, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry that I just, you know, murdered your son. I know you must be going through a lot right now, and this is a really tough time for you. Would you like to own the pistol that did it? In letters that he wrote before the duel took place, Hamilton said that he was planning to intentionally miss Burr with his shot, which, like is mildly suggestive of, like, suicidal intentions. So, like, that's questionable. But also, people who were there for the duel claim that due to the way the two men were standing, the sun was actually rising behind Burr, and they noted that Hamilton seemed disoriented. So, people just assumed that Hamilton was, like, distracted by the sunlight. But, you know, Considering that Hamilton kind of hated himself and wanted to die anyway, and he was standing on the spot where his son died, he may have been disoriented for a number of other reasons. Regardless, what happened is this. Hamilton and Burr both fired shots. Hamilton's bullet missed its target, while Burr's bullet hit Hamilton right above the, his right hip and his abdomen. Hamilton was rushed out of the area to a friend's house in New York, and he died there the following day. Dueling was illegal both in New Jersey, where the duel actually took place, and New York, where Hamilton died, so Burr was in double trouble. He fled to South Carolina for a bit, but eventually did return to Washington, D.C. to finish out his presidential term as casually as possible, as if he, you know, hadn't just murdered a man who was simultaneously both America's greatest genius and its greatest complete freaking moron. That was depressing. But you know what's not depressing? What actually went down between Adams and Jefferson. And I promised you guys that I was going to tell you about that anyway, so um, let, let's talk about that now. For like 10 years, Jefferson and Adams don't ever talk or correspond or anything. They just kind of mutually ignore each other. In 1804, there's some brief correspondence between Jefferson and Adams' wife, Abigail, in which they share some fierce roasts and political debates, and I highly recommend that you go and read those letters because not only are they entertaining, everyone back then thought that women were, like, too frail and dainty for politics, to which Abigail Adams responds, are you sure about that? But, um, yeah, outside of that little thing, there's no correspondence between Jefferson and any of the Adams family or anything. They're, they just, they don't talk at all. Like, eight years after that, this dude, Benjamin Rush, who is another founding father that you've probably never heard of. Anyway, he goes up to John Adams and he's like, yo, dude, why aren't you and Thomas Jefferson talking anymore? Like, come on, like, who cares about that time he hired a guy to call you a hermaphrodite? Like, can't, can't we all just be friends. Like, back in those 1776 days, those were such a wonderful time. Come on, man, can't we all just appreciate each other? So Adams is like, okay, if, if you insist. And so he sends Jefferson a letter, and I think he also sends him a book that his cousin wrote for some reason. And then, even then, the language that Adams uses in that letter is, like, really weird. So for a while, I didn't realize that he was talking about a book, and I was just super confused. But, like, I'm I'm pretty sure it was a book that he sent him. I'm, like, 95% sure, I think. Anyway, Adams and Jefferson start bonding over the fact that they're, like, both really old now. And they start reflecting on, like, their political careers and stuff. And they even start agreeing on, like, political stuff. Adams is like, hey, I'm kind of concerned about slavery because, you know, there's a bunch of people in this country who are being dehumanized, abused, and treated like property. And, you know, I, I just, I just don't think that's a good time. I, I think that's wrong. And Jefferson is like, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, I say, as I own, like, 600 slaves. And, you know, and some of them are my kids. And I could totally just release them at any time that I wanted to. But I'm not going to. After spending years doing nothing but trying to ruin each other's political careers, Adams and Jefferson just become complete and total bros during the last years of their lives. And, like, I want to be upset about this, but, like, it's so hilarious that I just... I just can't. Fast forward to 1826, John Adams is dying, and his last words are, Thomas Jefferson survives. Like, that's, that's how much bromance was going on between these two. Like, Adams is like, I may be dying, but you know what? My boy Thomas Jefferson will live on for years to come. The irony of this is that Jefferson didn't survive. He died on the same day as Adams, just a few hours before him. And you know what day that was?
July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Abby, what a marvelous world it is that we live in. I'll see you on Friday.